The following program is brought to you by Caltech. So Dr. Henry uh, Garrett has a wide variety of experience uh, 120, over 120 uh, publications uh, on the space environment and its effects. Um, at JPL, he has been responsible for defining the space environment and its effects on reliability of many NASA uh, missions, uh, ranging from Galileo and Cassini to uh, Juno and Europa. He has published two textbooks. In 1992, he was reassigned temporarily to the Pentagon uh, where he was deputy program manager for the Clementine Lunar Missions. Uh, for co contributions to this mission in measuring the, the Earth and translunar space environments and their effects on the reliability of advanced space systems, he was awarded NASA's Medal of Excellence, uh, Exceptional Engineering Achievement. Uh, he returned to JPL in 1994 where he has served as the chief technologist uh, for the Office of Safety and Mission Assurance until 2011. Dr. Garrett is an international uh, consultant on the terrestrial and interplanetary spacecraft environments and spacecraft reliability. Um, and he is an associate fellow of the AIAA. In 2006, Dr. Garrett received NASA Exceptional uh, Service Medal for his uh, achievements in advancing uh, the understanding of the space environment and effects. Recently, Dr. Garrett co-authored the primary NASA standard on spacecraft surface and internal charging of Earth missions. And I want to just add that, that um, Henry was kind of a last minute addition because uh, uh, notably, uh, John and Mitch felt that we were leaving off a very important subject which was the subject of the space, the, the deep space environment and its effect on resilient space systems. So with that, Henry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I've worked with several of you in this room and I think you know my work and what I do. Uh, basically, whenever JPL goes into a new environment, uh, they have to have somebody specify what they're going to experience. Whether it's an atmosphere around the planet, whether it's a volcano at Io, whether it's the uh, comet environment and the micrometeoroids associated with that, whether it's the radiation environment in interstellar space, I'm usually called on to at least evaluate or give a backup explanation of what we're expecting. Now, normally I would be talking to you about extreme radiation environments or micrometeoroids impacts and stuff for planets. For, for example, I've been heavily involved in the, in the Europa missions of late. Uh, right now I'm working on the radiation belts around Uranus. So try to give a variety of different environments. What you're going to hear today is a specific talk that I produced uh, at the request of the library actually on uh, interstellar travel. Uh, for about five years I was, uh, I put together and was lead for uh, a, a program for NASA on ultra reliability of which one component was interstellar travel. We looked at everything from aircraft reliability through to launch reliability, all the different aspects. How do you get that extra four or five nines that you need to survive? Out of that came the study you're going to see right now with my colleague Andrew Shapiro on uh, what there is about the interstellar environment that we know and what we can use uh, to predict how it's going to behave. I present this as an example of how one goes about looking at a mission, analyzing it, seeing what the problems are that you might experience, and trying to identify the tall tent poles, as we say, in that mission scenario. Hopefully along the way, uh, you'll get some of the ideas and enthusiasm that at least I feel for this type of work. Now comes the great moment. Does the arrow work? Ah, it does. And is there a laser? Is that the red, the red pointer? <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. I'm going to have to sit every so often. I hurt my back recently. And the last time I, I gave a talk like this was about two months ago, I got home and, and I'd hurt my back in the process. So we'll see if I can avoid doing that again. 
I'd like to go through very briefly a background on interstellar flight travel, just to give you why we are interested. I think you, you, most of us know that, but you might not know some of the details. Then I'd like to go over the general liability concerns, and then I've summarized for you some of the key issues in addition to the space environment that we need to consider. For example, politics. And by politics, I mean the issues of even flying, for example, uh, a nuclear power source. There's a bunch of, there's all kinds of unrelated issues that you would be surprised that you have to worry about when you get into long term reliability and resilience of missions. And then I give you some references. Uh, I don't know how many of you are, uh, were involved in this, but I, uh, at least four or f two or three people in the room I know were. And this is the 1,000 astronomical mu uh, mission, the Tau mission, was one of the things we were looking at. Specifically, we were looking at solar sails and how they could be used to drive missions out of the solar system. And you can get, fairly, you can get up to fairly high speeds. Within five to 10 years, you can easily get out to uh, where the Voyagers are right now if you use one of these uh, exotic uh, solar sail missions. I'm currently doing the space environments this week, in fact, for the uh, Lagarde uh, solar sail mission. And we're very interested in supporting them and, and theirs, which will launch, I think, in about a year and a half uh, if their schedules, uh, I think, if they adhere to their schedule. That will be about a 40 meter solar sail that we're, they're planning to fly. And I'm doing the type of analysis you'll see today for that mission. Well, why do we want to go out there? Why would we like to go into interstellar space? Well, to meet aliens, of course. But the other thing is there's a lot of science to be done. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, we can look at the uh, heliopause. We, if we can get to where the so-called uh, uh, gravitational focus is for the sun. And we can basically look back with the spacecraft and see, uh, use it, the sun as a, uh, a focusing element. There are a number of other things that we can do. We can get a large baseline by being out of 1,000 astronomical units, doing interferometry, doing a whole bunch of different types of very interesting experiments. So scientifically, there are a number of interesting things that we can do. We can search for new worlds, obviously, search for life, boldly go where no man has gone before. Uh, those are some of the, shall we say, more exotic reasons we would like to do that. I thought Paulette was going to be here. I know she, I saw her earlier for lunch. Uh, this is some of the work that she did. But I think this is basically the real reason that we would like to go into interstellar space, sort of meet the aliens, as they say. But this is some of the, this is where do we go and why do we want to do it? Well, first of all, what would be a reasonable mission to do? Well, the closest star, of course, is Proxima Centauri at 4.2 light years. Then you can go, then after that, as we're finding out, I, I looked last night, there are now 780 planets have been identified. 780 planets. A whole new solar system was announced yesterday that may have an Earth-like planet in it. I saw it on the web last night and downloaded it. Uh, in the last 48 hours, they've discovered a, an Earth-like solar system, supposedly. So those are the types of destinations that we can look for in the near future. But one of the things I want to point out to you is that at about 15 to 20 light years, we're starting to find planets that we could go and visit if we want. Obviously, the two extremes are the 4.2 light years and 15.4 light years. Now, one of the things here is we'd like to do it in our lifetime. I mean, if you look at it, as we'll see in a second, we're going to get to other planets and things in 20, 30,000 years, but I'm not particularly interested in doing a mission that's going to do that. I want something that I could be involved in that I could see. That means for the typical scientist, about 30 to 40 years, maybe 50 years at the outreach. So that means that whatever kind of resilient system you people are talking about, at least 40 to 50 years is kind of the timeline that we're looking at when we say reliant, reliable, resilient systems. So here's some of the missions that we could go to. This one right here, I think it's pronounced Gleis 581C, is a little bit, is about 50% bigger than the Earth and five times more massive. But the bottom line is, it does offer us the opportunity, a target that, in our, that we people sitting in this room could look at to, to the possibility of sending something to, with hopes of actually seeing a useful target on the other end. It's apparently down here, as of today, 784 of these have been discovered. And this isn't even the newest news. Like I say, last, last two nights I was following it, and there's now solar systems. So that's the excitement what we would like to do. We would like to be, I mean, after Pluto, what is there? Well, and the Kuiper Belt 
and the Oort cloud. Well, the next thing is the nearby stars. How do we get there? Um, I think, how many of people in, in here uh, know uh, Bob Frisbee? Okay. Well, Bob is, was really one of the great thinkers, I think, in this field. And he provided me most of this information that you see here. These are the different types of techniques that we've come up with. I think you recognize most of them. I mean, they're, they're not, whether any of them will work or not is a different issue. But fission, fusion, those are the obvious ways to go. I'll show you my, my favorite one is simply the fission. Throw bombs out the back I'll sh as one way of doing it. The solar sail is another that I'm working on. As you know, we can at least get to, to uh, 1,000 astronomical units with solar sails by, uh, by using the solar sail to kill our, uh, our orbital velocity, fall into the sun radially, unfurl the thing, and then shoot out of the solar system. And supposedly, if you do it right, you can, get ex you can reach very high accelerations all the way out to Jupiter. You can still be accelerated. Of course, uh, Ro Robert Ford came up with the ideas of then using lasers to blast it further on out of there. But again, virtually all of these would require most of the re Earth's resources for 20 or 30 years to build them, as currently conceived. But there's new ways, new routes to go. We can build small, almost CubeSat-like satellites, put them on a solar sail, and send them out in all different directions is one possibility to try to map out the, the heliopause. Those are things that we could do with current technology and do them over a fairly large volume in a relatively short time. So there are missions that could use some of these concepts and t test them out. Again, my favorite is the throwing the bombs out the back because we've actually built that. As you'll see here, this is my favorite. I, I grew up in a small town in New Mexico called Roswell. Uh, I was born in 1948, if that makes, if anybody recognizes the date. Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, I'm a native of Roswell, New Mexico. The, the thing that Roswell is noted for is the Robert H. Goddard Museum. It was the first spaceport in the United States and the world. Uh, Goddard moved, the, it was run out of Worcester, Mass, because he caught the third rocket started a fire in the field and the farmers got mad and, and, and ran him off. And a fellow named Lindbergh put him up with a guy named Guggenheim and uh, they moved him to Roswell. So Roswell is noted as the first spaceport in the world. And Rob, uh, Goddard, I met Mrs. Goddard. She came to town a few times when I was growing up. And when his first rocket actually was not the liquid propellant rocket. It's this little thing up here. It's a little funnel and he would shoot little TNT charges into it and use that to explode it. Well, they improved on that concept in one of the earliest nuclear rockets. What the idea was to drop a, uh, a few kiloton charges out the back and cause acceleration there. They demonstrated that it can be done. This technique works. It's actually a patented technique for interstellar travel developed by Robert H. Goddard. So the idea is not new. And in some respects, it can actually be done. I don't know if you've met with Harry Finger. I've uh, sponsored some uh, presentations he gave on, on the nuclear propulsion. So it is a possibility. I'm just trying to whet your appetite to know that, there, that interstellar travel is not that far away. We can actually do it. And the bottom line is we're doing it right now. And several of you in this room I recognize worked on Voyager or are working on Voyager right now. The latest I heard is, uh, am I right, that in the last week we may actually have crossed out. There was a sharp uh, boundary increase in the data. Yeah, I see you shaking your head, yeah. Uh, we may actually have made it at least uh, to the shock boundary uh, on that. I just did some recent work on this uh, for JPL, trying to, as you'll see, some of the work. But, so we're doing it. And th there was a satellite called IMP-8, is shown up here. IMP-8 lasted almost, I think, 38 years. And that one satellite, 38 years measuring the solar wind. Right there, we have a very resilient, very long-lived system in a fairly harsh environment that made it. It's now being, it'll be superseded, hopefully, in a few years by the Voyagers themselves, which are well over 30 years, as you know. And this is where they are right now. Uh, Pioneer 10 will meet Ross 248 a little bit longer than I would like, in 32,000 years. Pioneer 11, 42,000 years. Uh, Voyager will make it, a, Voyager will actually reach a star in 40,000 years. Unfortunately, Voyager 2 is not aimed at anything uh, for about 500,000 years. But then again, if you, it just depends on your perspective. Uh, so 
I don't know, I have, I have one apocryphal tale uh, for contamination purposes I'd like to make. Uh, how many of you remember who Vager was from the Star Trek movie? You remember Vager? Well, it turns out that Vager, they, they intercepted the, the spacecraft, Voyage, uh, Voyager, and they thought that was the way people on Earth were, were robots, and they sent it back to Earth. That's not what's going to happen. Don't know if you know this, but on vo one of the Voyagers, uh, while it was up in building 144, uh, somebody saw some ants, and they sprayed them with Raid. That little bugger's got ants all inside it. So what's going to come back to Earth is not Vager, but it's going to be one giant ant, if you remember the story. Anyway. Uh, if some of you probably are well aware, uh, our whole outlook of the, sol of the heliosphere is changing because of the Voyager data. In other words, right now, from a very long-lived mission, we're getting very useful data as we approach interstellar space. So interstellar travel is not only, uh, not, uh, only possible, it's happening right now, and we're getting very useful results. So my premise is that interstellar travel is something that we should be looking at from a resiliency standpoint, from a reliability standpoint, as an, and as an example of how we would do long life missions. Politically, it's very important too to consider. That's, that's a political institution for 30 years, living in a society where every four to eight years things can change very dramatically. Do you realize that voids are still going and still being politically supported? If you, I don't know if you've been following the news, but this is the old view, the uh, solar wind, the neutral sheets, the current sheets uh, pile up or are believed to pile up at the edge. Uh, some of the latest theories claim for, based on Voyager data that instead of the, the, of the uh, uh, neutral sheets piling up, they actually form a foam. There's merging across the sheets and you get magnetic bubbles and stuff, a very complex, very rich environment there. There's a major discovery, potentially, if it's, if it's borne out, coming from a satellite that's over 30 years old. Uh, so let's see what that means. What can, we, what, what can we do with that kind of information? Well, let's look at some of the things taking as an example what we've seen from Voyager and the pioneers and, some of our, and from what we see from ground-based observations. I'd like to take you down through some of these. I'm going to, and obviously because of my background, I'm going to concentrate on the environment, and on particularly two or three environments that I think are very real concern that can affect the operations of spacecraft over these long periods of time, simply because of the effects that they can have, the catastrophic effects. I've discussed the, the propulsion systems are another issue. We need to know when we look at a, a system to determine its, rel its reliability and its resilience, we need to know what the propulsion system is going to be. There's a big difference between having nuclear fusion, fission, or, so, or a laser shining on you because of the secondary uh, materials and such that can affect you. Uh, as you know, in some of the for Ford's concepts, they're actually intercepting pellets on the way. Somebody leaves a trail and you, you, you go down along the trail towards the star and absorb the anti uh, the uh, positron pellets or something as you go, or bombs or whatever you want to want, want to do. Whereas other concepts have you being hit by a laser, and of course atomic bombs out the back put a fairly hefty environment on the mission. So the propulsion system has a big uh, driver on how you would design your system. Electronic systems, the biggest thing is that electronics is evolving very rapidly right now. We don't exactly have uh, vacuum tubes on Voyager, but we have stuff that's very old technology. We have stuff that was programmed with machine language. What are we programming? How many people in this room can program in machine language? Ah, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Everybody over a certain age. No, you look fairly, you look fairly young. <laughs> Many, many kids, when I give this presentation, most people don't even know what I mean when I say machine language. <laughs> it's kind of pathetic. So you have to actually have people. Part of the resiliency is having the people on Earth that have the knowledge to go back to when we were doing things with chisels and on rock. And, uh, and look back at how, in the old days, uh, how we did things, because that may be what you're flying 30 or 40 years from now. So heritage. And people that know how to do this have to, be to, have to be maintained. Voyager being a very good case in point. Mechanical systems, of course, wear out. Um, they wear out in a variety of different ways. I'm not going to go into it too much. 
Uh, but think of it this way. Look at the dust on the moon uh, or on Mars that can permeate everything. That dust is electrostatically charged in many cases. Just think of what happened with the astronauts the first time. They, they wipe their hand across their visor and it scratches it and they can't see out. The same thing with optical surfaces and such like that. They get dust on them. How do you get the dust off? And that, that affects over the long run how well you can see through your windows, through your optics and things like that. So there's a variety of different environments. Normally at this point, what I would provide you is a, is a grid that shows all the different environments and all the different effects that we have to do. I've taken a subset of that today to, to simplify that. But that's what you have to do for every mission when you go to talk about reliability and resilience. You have to look at the environments it's going to fly in and the types of effects that you're going to have. Uh, materials, of course. I, whoops, I didn't mean to go ahead. One of the big problems we have in materials, for example, is on the outer boundary of a spacecraft, in the solar system at least, you can easily get over 10 to the ninth rads in the first few microns. That's a billion rads of, of radiation damage. Uh, it's not that much because, of course, it's over just a micron or something, and you absorb it very quickly. But that amount of energy does some severe damage to the outer surfaces of most space vehicles. In fact, I can tell you that without any effect of anybody disagreeing with me, is that the outer layer of any spacecraft, after it's been on orbit about six to seven months, nobody really knows what it looks like. The thermal properties, everything on the outside of the spacecraft, from micrometeoroid pits to oxygen erosion to uh, contamination from the thrusters to radiation damage, the outer surfaces of the spacecraft change dramatically. From my standpoint as a spacecraft charging expert, that causes very real problems with trying to figure out how that, in, that spacecraft interacts with the environment over the long term. We flew a thing called a SCATHA satellite. I was the project scientist for that, spacecraft charging at high altitudes. And after three or four years on orbit, we found that a lot of the materials completely changed their properties due to various radiation effects, arc discharges, and things like that. Things that were conductors became non-conductors. Things that were non-conductors began to conduct better. Thermal properties changed. So for a long time, any mission that you fly for more than a few years uh, anything in the solar system, at least, is going to be, have massive changes to its outer surfaces and to its properties. So that's one of the things you need to take into account when you talk about what, what, what you mean when you say resilient systems. Uh, infrastructure, that's the people who uh, support it, as I've said. You have to keep the people on hand who know, or at least some way to trace the history of people that know machine language. They know how to program, and God forbid, the language I program in every day, Fortran. Uh, this last week, uh, this, this summer, I've had three or four students go to work for me, summer students. Not one of them even knew the words Fortran. It's embarrassing when you go in and say, can you program for me in Fortran? So I only do Python. Or, <laughs> I mean, that seems to be this, this week's language is Python. God, I remember Algol and <laughs> Snowball and Cobol. Those were the languages when I was growing up, when I was their age. If you could do Cobol, you could get a job at any bank in the country. Anyway. So infrastructure, how do we keep the people? Mission assurance, my job, the people that I work for, is something that's often overlooked in, in programs. We're an expense. Uh, and I must, I must admit, sometimes we're looked at very negatively because we take away from a project's uh, cost. But at the same time, uh, one of the things that we add is resiliency. Our mission, basically, is to make sure that things will survive perform what they're supposed to do under the most adverse conditions. And we have, we have people, Jane Owa here is one of our people from our software reliability group uh, here in the audience. Uh, other people here I've worked with uh, are involved in all aspects of the reliability things, from, the, from making sure that when MSL cuts those cables in a few days, they're not going to short everything out, to uh, worrying about the uh, buildup of static charge as it comes in and lands in the atmosphere there on the ground. So Mission Assurance does all that. And the software aspects of it, as I said, uh, is another key issue. And finally, down here, the two key things that you've all been talking about already is integrated system health management and navigation and attitude control, and how you manage those in a very harsh space environment, such as in, we're going to talk about now interstellar space. So let's look at what we mean when we look at reliable systems. What are we really talking about? Well, these are the things that make them unreliable. 
They range from uh, basic design flaws to environmental effects to part selection. You, fig you pick p bad parts, they're going to fail, uh, period, with time. Uh, you have to pick parts that not only last simply uh, for a long time period, that will work for a long time, but you have to pick parts that are not sensitive to the radiation environment, that are not sensitive to electrostatic sho shock, things of that nature. Quality is a big issue. Um, if you can build things cheap, as I understand MSL, the titanium wasn't titanium. And so the quality assurance there failed, but, they, but the people here caught it, thank God, and they were fixing it. So quality can, is always in, in the back. Operators. As we know, the second Viking uh, lander was lost because, because the operator uh, was a young fellow and he put the wrong command in and it looked the wrong way. Uh, other things, things that uh, just uh, uh, other types of processes. And there's a bunch of unknown ones over here. Uh, Fully about uh, 30 percent, uh, 25 to 30 percent of the reason spacecraft fail is unknown, simply because we typically don't fly enough uh, sensors on there to tell us what's wrong. And that's one of my big bugaboos. I'm going to say that right up front. I think every JPL spa spacecraft that flies should have a black box flight recorder in the strictest sense of the word, just like you do for aircraft, with some way to get that information back to the Earth so that you know what, what happened when they failed. Uh, as you remember, what was it, uh, was it Mars Observer? The long one, the one that failed on the way when they uh, filed. N nothing. They have no idea really how that failed because they didn't have anything telling them what, uh, what might go wrong on it. So environment is a major driver. It's about 25 to 30 percent, and probably half of the unknown are environmentally related effects. So that's why I'm here. If you want to design a resilient system, you're going to have to take the environment into account. You can't just look at the software and the mechanical parts. You have to look at what the environment's doing you, to you. And there's a variety of issues, as we'll talk about, that can affect you. Uh, this is what I make, base my business on. The reason I was hired was when they saw this chart, they found out the spacecraft charging is probably the number one cause of spacecraft failures. Depending on how much time we have, uh, I'll show you an example of internal electrostatic discharge and what we're talking about. I have a nice little movie that uh, very clearly illustrates the problem and I have a chunk of, of material that's been affected. Long-term exposure to the space environment causes the buildup of electrons and things and they can discharge. And uh, typically that's what happens. Spacecraft discharge. Just like walking across the floor and charging yourself up. There are a number of other causes of failures as you know. Uh, surface ESD, sur uh, total radiation, micrometeoroid impact, and if you remember recently, a uh, Soviet satellite ran into one of the iridium satellites and they blew each other, managed to blow each other up. So uh, my space debris, micrometeoroids and stuff are very real possibilities. Radiation is what we usually worry about and my group has, a, has about 30 or 40 people dedicated to nothing but worrying about radiation effects, radiation effects on parts. And my, one of my biggest jobs is specifying the radiation environments throughout the solar system. This is some of the things that radiation can do to you. Uh, this is the uh, side of the Hubble Space Telescope. And if you notice, the, just the material just fell apart. That's the thermal blanket. It got worn out from being in space from atomic oxygen and radiation effects. And the mylar blankets just ripped. You can see down here, here's an example of something called TEDLAR, uh, silver-coated Teflon after about three to four years in a simulated geosynchronous environment. That started out as basically silver white, uh, something, like, something like this. These are typical white paints, showing you how they decay. It's work from Aerospace Corp that they provided us, showing you how just the surface materials change in their color and their conductivity and their strength. Basically, things fall apart in the space environment when exposed long term to the radiation and thermal effects that you get there. So one of the big issues is radiation. Now, this is just a, a quick and dirty, uh, not overly accurate, but give you a feel for the different types of radiation environments for your resilient systems. You can see that for MEO orbit, uh, that for about a tenth of an inch to about a half an inch of shielding, you can see that the radiation is about uh, 100 uh, kilorads per year. That's sort of the design uh, goal. People typically talk in my profession about a tenth of an inch or a hundredth inch 
a tenth of an inch, 100 mils of shielding. If you're looking at geosynchronous around 200 to, to uh, uh, kilorads to 20,000 kilorads, uh, two th yeah, 2,000 kilorads uh, per year uh, as a dose. And that's sort of the upper limit that we design things. We design geosynchronous satellites typically for 15 years is the standard design life. And so this is sort of, so the, down here you can see that geo, thank God, is only about 100 kilorads per year, uh, not the thousands that you would get at MEO. But MEO is where we got the GPS and some of the other satellites that are very rad hard. Uh, of course, the Jovian environment is extremely bad. You can get down here. You can easily get up to a kilorad per year. And at Europa, we were looking at megarads for the 30 days that we were there, uh, depending on whether you had 100 mils or uh, a few, uh, few hundred kilorads if you had a half an inch of shielding, which is what we were typically talking about on Galileo, for example. So of course, the worst down here is the nuclear environment from w nuclear weapons. and. Um, at least we forget uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s, we did pop nuclear weapons off in space and took out a bunch of the spacecraft over time. Uh, yeah, and Argus, Starfish and Argus. And they did a quite, a, quite a bit of damage. In fact, to this day, we're not totally sure that the inner belts were really the inner belts because we popped them off before we did the testing. And I don't know if you know, the, I have to tell one, another joke about that. When they blew them off over Kwajalein at 500 kilometers, the EMP pulse produced in the top of the ionosphere opened garage doors as far away as Honolulu. And apparently some of the cars uh, burned out their systems. And that ended overnight the um, uh, safeguard system in the United States where they put nuclear bombs on the t tips of Nike missiles to defend us. Because the first time they took out, a, the first Nike that fired and took out the first Soviet uh, bomb would take out the entire United States with a single EMP pulse. So it's sort of that, you wondered why we didn't ever go further with Nike, that was why. Anyway, that gives you some idea of the background. Uh, the, on the left is the single, whoops, I'm sorry. On the left is the single event upset environment. And you can get some idea, again, that Jupiter, uh, this is the cosmic rays and trapped. Uh, susceptibility and, and gigabits per uh, f bit flips per gigabits per year. It's a rather crude course way we tried to do it, but it gives you some idea of the range of the upset rates. So what are the environments we worry about? Well, they're basically from a radiation standpoint, there are two, two primary types of things we would worry about on an interstellar mission. One is a long-term total ionizing dose from the galactic cosmic rays. The second is a single event upset environment resulting from those particles. These are the environments. Uh, Dick Mewalt helped me put these together. On the left up here, this is the thermal shock plasma. On the left up here, this would be for hydrogen and helium and oxygen. In this energy range from 10 MeV per nucleon up to about 100 MeV per nucleon is what we call the so-called uh, anomalous cosmic ray environments where there's uh, single charged uh, galactic cosmic rays coming in, and uh, they can penetrate much farther than the multiply ionized uh, cosmic rays into the solar system. This is the uh, ambient GCR environment at higher energies, as you can see up here. This shows you what the, uh, this is the helios sheath. This is where Voyager is right now. This is, the upper curves are the best guess of what we think they're going to see when we finally get into interstellar space. Uh, you can notice above about uh, 100 MeV per nucleon, there's no effect, and that's basically pure, uh, uh, inv pure GCR environment from there on down. So we're actually seeing the uh, interstellar space from here over. This is, what we've, this is what's modulated by the Earth's heliosphere right in here. Interesting enough, this is the solar minimum spectrum. This is the solar maximum spectrum. That's for hydrogen, helium, oxygen group, and the iron group of particles gives you some feel for what, what the uh, fluxes are and the, and the energy ranges. This is the same thing over here for the electrons. The electrons are several orders of magnitude down in flux from the uh, protons and the, uh, in the galactic cosmic rays, because they apparently because they scatter better. But that gives you at least a range of what they might look like in uh, interstellar space. So that's the interstellar space radiation environment. That's the stuff you're gonna be exposed for for 20 to 50 years when you're out there. This is what it looks like at the t high end. 
Notice that it goes up to above, almost 10 to the 21st electron volts. As I understand it, the uh, uh, leftover uh, Big Bang radiation, the 3 centimeter, 2.3 centimeter, whatever it is, line down there, is what the, ultimately what the highest energy particles get scattered by, and so there's, apparently they keep it from uh, getting much higher than that, which I thought was kind of interesting. So we go back to the Big Bang to explain why there's nothing above 10 to the 20, 23. But this is what the entire spectrum looks like uh, for over the whole length. And you can see it's pretty impressive. One of the particles in this range uh, basically lights up the atmosphere when they hit, if I remember. Uh, I think it's in, uh, is it per, uh, Atacama Desert where they have that uh, eye, uh, fly spec sensors and stuff. The high energy, what? Fly's eye, okay. Yeah, yeah, and you can see these things at night. One one particle come in and just hit up, light up the the evening sky, and then then you get gamma rays and stuff. And what's frightening is that they <laughs> they see this stuff a lot more frequently than you think. In other words, there's gamma ray, big gamma ray bursts and things going on that can light up our sky at night. And I never, you know. Of course, I'm a lightning person, and I never realized that it was doing the op shooting out cos uh, galactic cosmic rays in the other direction from the lightning storms. Uh, this is what the radiation dose would look like for a roughly a 20-year mission in interstellar space, a best, best guess and a worst guess. So you can see that you're not looking at huge amounts of total ionizing dose. You're looking at something on the order of, uh, of about 10 kilorads for uh, a few mils up to about 100 to 1,000. This is about an inch over here. You're looking at about 1,000 uh, rads, which is kind of tiny when you really think about it compared to what you see for one solar proton event. So the bottom line is even for an interstellar mission, solar proton events on the way out are going to be the main driver for these types of missions. And uh, get, the sooner you get out of the solar system, the better off you are. So that gives you an idea of what the radiation environment would look like from a total dose standpoint. Of course, that, the, you've got this constant background. It's always there. You're not going to be able to get rid of that. And in particular, you've got the background galactic cosmic rays. Uh, to give you a recent reference, in the two-year mission, a manned mission to Mars, for the, the, given how resilient the, America, the human body is, turns out you need at least a meter of water for the astronauts now to meet the latest NASA requirements for survivability. I think the survivability requirement is the cancer smoking rate. They have to show that they haven't been more than a factor of two or three over that. Stop and think. For a two-year mission, they have to have a meter in every direction around an astronaut before they're going to let us fly that mission, just because of the galactic cosmic ray background for the, uh, those kinds of alterations. So. That's the, sort of the good news. The good news is that the background radiation, except for the long-term GCR damage, is not as bad as we thought. But now we get into something that's, that is frightening. And starting with the dust, um, I don't know how many of you follow the um, ENA, the Energetic Neutral At Atom Spec uh, mission, uh, astro uh, missions that they've been flying. Where they, what they do is they look at very high energy neutral particles, they ionize them in the spectrometer, and then they can get a spectrum, and they can use them like a telescope. We can see a band of neutral particles uh, on the helios pause out there. Uh, there's a very narrow band out at, at the heliopause. We can also see that with the Cassini mission, the Enith, uh, whatever, I forget the name of the spacecraft, at Earth. Uh, I, Ibex or something. Anyway, they can see the uh, they can see this band of neutral gas that we're running into. So there's a band of neutral gas out. Whoops, I'm sorry. Band of neutral gas out there that we have to worry about. And the neutral atoms. Why do we care? Well, a proton uh, going at two tenths the speed of light, the speed we'd like to go to get one of these stars in 50 years. We're going at tenth or two tenths the speed of light. That's about a, several MeV, million electron volts of energy. So you're generating relativistic particles as the closer, the higher the speed of light that you go to get there. So one of the big issues is the background radiation produced simply by the fact that you're going so fast. Uh, superimpose on that. This, by the way, is the density of that gas. Um, so, th so that produces its own dose. Come down here. Uh, the other problem is interstellar grains. 
the interstellar grains are not very well known, unfortunately, but what they do think, these are guesses at what we think the, um, how many kilograms per cubic meter, mean gra mass is about 10 to the minus 16th kilograms. And for the original Daedalus study, I don't know how many of you are aware of the Daedalus, but there's Daedalus and Icarus studies. The Icarus is the, is the latest incarnation of the inter uh, British Interplanetary Society's study of interstellar travel. And one of the things that they've looked at is the effects of the environment and all these different issues that I'm talking about. They've done a very thorough resiliency study starting back in the uh, 1978 time frame. Uh, and they've just recently, in the last two or three years, have been doing the, well, the son of Daedalus, Icarus, obviously. And they're doing a new study of how to do that mission. And they came, uh, Martin came up with these estimates of what the, um, what, how many kilograms per square meter would be eroded over a 20-year mission. And you can see there that for a, a ten, a two tenths of the speed of light, you're t talking about 30 grams per square meter, uh, which is about a centimeter of aluminum just simply being eroded by micrometeoroid dust impacts from the, basically from the dust in the, so in the interstellar space, let alone the amount of energy that's generated. Because remember, this stuff's hitting you at the speed of light. There's going to be x-rays, gamma rays, things, secondary particles generated. So there's a very substantial environment just from going through the medium. Now, let me give you another aspect. I haven't bothered, well, I actually, I've calculated in other papers, but I'm not going to present them here, uh, what the actual erosion rate would be from, uh, collision rate would be from micrometeoroids. But believe it or not, we can see the interstellar micrometeoroid environment at the Earth. The reason for that is that there's a class of, of meteoroids, when they hit the atmosphere, they're going in excess of 70 kilometers per second. 70 kilometers per second is roughly the escape velocity for the solar system. So if you see a particle going 70 kilometers per second, the only thing it can be is micrometeoroids from interstellar, whoops, from the Earth. I'm sorry, I keep pushing that instead of the, the button. But that's right here. This is the interstellar distribution of micrometeoroids down here, or at least somebody at best guess at that. Uh, for Earth, treating Earth as a spaceship, uh, for a 10 to the minus 10th gram particle, the flux is about 10 to the minus 19th per meter, or one impact per square meter in 20 years. Um, doesn't sound like much, but remember, you're going to probably fly a fairly large spacecraft, and something like that's going to be hitting you. You can imagine the amount of energy if you're going at some fraction of the speed of light. So the bottom line is that what, where the radiation might not be all that bad for the long run, except for the single limit upsets, which is always going to be there, the big problem is going to probably be micrometeoroids and the dust impacts on your spacecraft in interstellar space. Now, let's look at uh, from a different standpoint. In addition to just the plane environment itself, the mechanical environment, um, you need to look at how you're going to address some of the is issues peculiar to interstellar travel. For example, uh, the beam riders. This is the Robert Ford, use the laser thing. You're going to have to keep very accurate um, aiming and along a very narrow beam path, and whereas at the Earth, you're going to have to have one heck of a big laser trying to zap this thing out there all the way to the nearest star uh, if you go that route. There's ultra high levels of, not of autonomy, as you know, 9 to 40 years command turnaround. If you're going for a 20 year uh, away spacecraft, you're going to take 20 years there and 20 years back, uh, which is what the GLICE would require. Uh, even with the um, uh, Alpha Centauri, you got four and a half years out and four and a half years back. So just to make a command to go out and go back is going to be very arduous, as we already know for Voyager and even for uh, Cassini and on out into the, uh, uh, the, the, the Pluto mission that we've got going currently. Now, as we've you've already discussed, and as some of you here are specialists in, self-repair, system redundancy, and fault tolerance is going to be a very real issue. Now, I point out to you that um, redundancy doesn't necessarily hack it. If the reason you fail is because you have long-term, say, radiation damage on a part, putting six or seven backup transceivers in there, they're all going to be dead at the same time. So the idea is you have to have functional redundancy also. Look at what happened with Galileo. The thing that saved us by accident is we happened to accidentally have functional redundancy of a tape recorder 
on the Galileo mission in an omnidirectional antenna that saved us on that mission. I can go into the reasons the antenna failed. I was actually there the afternoon the primary antenna broke and I heard it and after that we didn't do the testing. Um, my solution to everything is test it. Test it and test it. Um, if, if you can't test it, I don't think you should fly it. And I mean test it in every real sense. One thing that we do not do is take the entire satellite, stick it in the environment, and just beat the hell out of it. That's what we did with Voyager 1, the Voyager missions. We had a third Voyager. We took that Voyager spacecraft, and Albert Whittlesey took an arc discharge source, walked up to the spacecraft, threw an arc on it, and blew out the science computer. And the, it scared the hell out of them. They went back, and they rewired the whole thing and fixed it so that a spacecraft arc discharge wouldn't have a big effect because they thought they might have discharge. I don't know how many of you realize it, but when Voyager 1 went by Jupiter, there were 42 uh, reset on power on reset anomalies due to spacecraft charging, internal electrostatic discharging on the spacecraft. Every one of those was something like 10 millisecond reset in the framing between the main flight computer and the uh, computer, uh, the main flight computer. And as a result of that, as you leave, Voyager, uh, as you leave Jupiter, the Voyager pictures slowly go out of uh, Jupiter, slowly go out of the field of view. We almost towards the end lost all of the uh, images, um, simply because of unexpected um, problems, but something that we actually did the right thing for. Continuing, the ability, uh, careful consideration of flight spares versus functional redundancies, I just said. Robots cap capable of in-flight repairs. Ultimately, we're going to have to have, we probably going to have to have little bots that go around on the outside and, and uh, fix things that have been clobbered by micrometeoroids, for example. Development of common replacement parts strategy. In other words, yeah, you, you may have to have units that uh, are, as we heard this morning and other times, that you, that you switch this unit in if that unit fails to uh, do it. Obvious things like that. Um, means for actively regenerating key systems in flight. That's going to be the main thing because they, you can get catastrophic loss from micrometeoroid impacts or something like that, as I was trying to point out. Advanced techniques for reconfiguring and reprogramming repro the electronic systems in flight. And the biggest thing is new institution. I've came across this Long Now Foundation. Is anybody here a member of that? Okay. And yeah, several of you. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Build a clock that'll last forever <laughs> just on mechanical parts and things like that. But that's the point. The idea of can we produce an institution that will span 50 years? Can we, pr can we build an institution that'll work successfully for 10 years um, or eight years given the current uh, political crises? So here are the key issues. This is to summarize what I want to talk about, what I talked about today. We've already reached interstellar space. We're capable of at least 35 year long missions. We know that. We've done at least three or four of them already. Propulsion at 10%, 20% of speed of light may be possible with current engineering techniques. Bob Frisbee told me he thinks it's not, and he's the world's greatest expert, but <laughs> bottom line is maybe. I like the solar sail concept of at least getting us out of the solar system. That can probably be done fairly quickly. Um, so 4.3 years, light years, might be possible for us. Now, the major natural environment concerns will be dust and meteorites. Not, the, not so much the radiation except for a single event's upset standpoint, scrambling your brains and stuff like that. We need to rethink our current maintainability procedures in light of 50 years in autonomous operations. Common parts, in-flight repair, as things that you all have all been discussing here and we'll probably look into a lot more detail. We need to develop robots capable of in-flight repairs. Somebody with a hammer that goes on the outside and beats the, the antenna back into shape or aims it back at the earth. We need to develop the development of common replacement parts strategies. In other words, if, if one system dies because one of the, the transistors went out on it, we need to be able to have other transistors that, we can, uh, that are similar that we can put into it in the extreme. And finally, the societal issues, what I think, are something that we, we, have to, we have to look at. And I hope you have some discussion of societal issues here, because I think that's one of the biggest problems. These are my references, uh, just to give you some ideas uh, on uh, where I got most of this material from. I have some of my own papers on it, but I haven't listed them up here.
but again, I put Frisbee first and, and Paulette Luer and Sarah Gavitt on their work on their stellar probes. I worked with them a lot on this type of things. That's basically it. I did want to stress, uh, since I think it's cute and I did want to leave you with fear, I'm going to pass this around. This is what happens to your spacecraft. They, they, they actually brought back surfaces from Mir and uh, uh, solar arrays and things on that. And what it is, is this is a chunk of plastic. Think of this as a circuit board or your outer layer of your solar arrays or something like that. High energy electrons come in from the side. Uh, protons are stopped at the surface and so there's a differential layer of charge built up in this dielectric. And as you'll see in the pictures, it creates inverse lightning pattern here. Uh, start passing around, I don't know if it'll get around fast enough. But to make a long story short, uh, this is the main kill mechanism for spacecraft because one of two things can happen. If you have circuit boards inside your spacecraft and you're exposed to high energy electron environment, the electrons can bury themselves in the circuit board or in the cabling at junctions and stuff like that. The, elect the charge builds up and it electrostatically discharges right at the device. The other extreme is one of our, one of our clients, one of our, our companies we used to work with, I'm still not allowed to use their name, they had a circuit board in which they put their initials in metal and the little metallic T arc to the little, magnetic R, little uh, metal R to the little ma uh, metal W into the circuit and took out the spacecraft circuit board. The idea being you don't want to have isolated um, metal either in your spacecraft. So anyway, to give you an idea, of the, uh, some of the problems, I want to show you this movie and just leave you with one thought. I know this isn't, this is, uh, let me see, uh, how do I do this, escape? And uh, let me see if I can get to the movie. My last thing I wanted to tell you, that you, you think you've seen resiliency, wait till you see this. This is what happens to your spacecraft. Oops, where's the noise? The noise was off. How do you turn the noise, the, vo the volume's up here. I don't know. Anyway, bottom line is, that's your spacecraft. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's what's happening on the surface of the space. You know when this phenomenon was discovered? It was discovered in, in, by Lichtenberg in the 1700s in the first physics laboratory. It's the, this phenomena is what gives us positive and negative electricity. He developed, he took a Leyden jar, charged it up with frog leg electricity and, ver and uh, static cat fur electricity and things like that. And he would hold, the, he would paint pottery shards and he'd hold the, 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 the electrode next to the, the pottery shards. And when he held, the, when held one orientation, he got this beautiful Lichtenberg pattern. And when he did the other orientation, he got sort of ugly spots. So the really pretty pattern, he called the electrode positive. It was attracting electrons. And so the electron Lichtenberg pattern is associated with the positive electrode. The ugly or a negative, uh, the, uh, the, uh, negative electrode is ugly and it was pulling protons and that's how we got supposedly, this is what the Germans claim when I was in his, his, on the wall in the laboratory there, that's how we got, neg how we got negative electricity was from this phenomenon. That's real time. That's your spacecraft. That's your circuit board <laughs> right there. I leave you with that thought. Now I can, I'll open it up for questions while, while you watch your spacecraft glow. <laughs>